Hi, River of Life. I can hardly believe it is nearly the end of 2019, and this is our final series this year called Key Life Choices for Growth, and it's very much geared towards 2020, looking at six massive issues in our lives that really set the stage for what would result in great growth if we could get things right in these areas. It's a foundation, if you like, a platform for 2020. And just before we launch into this, I'd really love to say a huge thank you to you as River of Life for the engagement and the response to the Nemaya series. Thank you so much for your partnership and participation. There have been so many people who've signed up for Rockets and Rock and Plugged In and Cutting Edge. So many people involved with the next generation. Many people involved in worship teams, hospitality teams, all sorts of other stuff, fuel. I can't even remember everything. And thank you so much for your generosity and the way that you are stewarding finances at this time. October, as you know, was our record month of giving this year, and then uh, September was, sorry, and then October dipped slightly, and we are feeling the fire of that. It dipped in uh, nominal terms and in real terms, and uh, there are salary adjustments and cutting back and all sorts of things happening under the surface. So please just keep going to God with your finances, keep honoring Him with it, Uh, It is so exciting to know that we serve a God who is our provider, and uh, let's keep honoring Him with our stuff. Even when it's difficult to calculate, what is 10% increase? How does this work? It's a very, very challenging time. But thank you so much for your generosity and your faithfulness. So straight into it uh, today, six areas in which key life choices for growth will have to be made. The first three are massive issues that we face on a day-to-day basis. We cannot escape them. And they are technology, sexuality, and money. And the following three are kind of deeper issues. They are massive, but these are things that if we make key life choices in, not everybody is making those life choices, and they actually lead to phenomenal growth if we can make those calls correctly. And they are word, spirit, and mission. And we're starting today in technology. So let's pray and we will dive right in. Father, thank you so much that you have called us in your wisdom to be responsible for our lives. You say, I set before you today life and death, blessing and cursing, you choose. And I pray, Father, that you would enable us through this series to put things in place in our lives, key life decisions that will really be a platform for growth in our lives and in the lives of those around us. We look in this series not only to our own needs, but to the needs of others, that we would fulfill your calling to be a blessing to the nations. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to take complex, massive, even controversial and emotive topics and distill down to the core essentials that we can build our lives on and make right decisions. Holy Spirit, please enable the preaching and the small group discussion and everything around the series to produce life, that we would choose life. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, technology is a very, very exciting subject. It is a massive subject And uh, it is defined by Britannica.com, which is Encyclopedia Britannica online, as the application of scientific knowledge to the practical aims of human life. The application of scientific knowledge to the practical aims of human life. It is the sum of skills, methods, and processes used in the production of goods and services or in the accomplishment of an objective. And the summary, the change or manipulation of human environment. The change or manipulation by man of his environment. And that really sums up technology. The first place we see technology in the Bible is in Genesis chapter 1. And we are told that in the beginning... 
there were, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the Spirit of God was over the depths of the deep. God created. In the very first verse of the Bible, technology is there. It is the scientific application of knowledge to practical aims of human life. God is exercising the use of technology, and it's his word. It's amazing that the word of God is the very basis of technology. In fact, we're told in Colossians that God holds all things together by the power of his word. So every computer chip that's running and every cell in our body, every single thing in the three trillion galaxies that man knows exist are held together by God's word. It is the very basis of technology. And then further on, down through Genesis, God forms man out of the dust of the earth, applying scientific knowledge, depth of wisdom to man's, to, to human life. And then as we know, man falls and God amazingly provides a superior technology to Adam's. Adam exercised the certain technology in his shame and in his rebellion, running away from God by putting fig leaves, sowing fig leaves. It was a type of clothing. And God obviously killed an animal, the first sign of the prophetic that Jesus would be a sacrifice for us. God killed an animal and clothed with superior clothing. And I love reading down through Genesis, Tubal Cain was the first who forged out of bronze and iron. It's Genesis 4, 22. And then there was the ark, and then there was the temple and musical instruments and technology all the way down, people writing letters. Uh, Jesus himself was a carpenter and will have used tools of different kinds, money. Perhaps the most epic example of technology is the cross. A man-made technology to inflict pain and destruction that God engages with in an absolutely tactile way and turns into the means for redemption of the human race. And down the ages from Jesus' time, technology progresses and progresses one age after the other until we hit our time now, which is the age of information. The information age. And the information age began and the whole rise of information over the industrial age. And then into that, like a steroid boost, the digital age. That took information onto an extrapolated curve. And quite extraordinary the growth that there has been through information technology over the last years. 1990, there was not one single website. You want to know what life was like in the 80s? Rick Warren says, just take your phone away and turn off the internet, and you've got the 80s. It's hard to imagine what that was like. 1989, I left school. That is what the world was like. 1990, the first website. 1992, a few more. 2030, 93, 94, 2,700 websites. 2017, the last one I looked at, 1.6 billion websites. This technology has taken a huge hold of our whole lives. On the slide coming up, seven areas that I see that technology is so significantly influenced. Communication, entertainment, lifestyle, health industry, education, travel, and robotics. And that's just a snapshot I mean, I just think about communication and how we used to write letters, and that was amazing. 1840, I collect stamps. First stamp, I've got three of them. They're a little bit damaged, penny blacks. 1840, first of May, postage stamp. Revolutionized communication. Two days, anywhere in England. Changed the world. And then that stamp across the seas. But now today, we write and instantaneously on the other side of the earth. Entertainment has opened up. Lifestyle, we no longer plug in, we no longer go to a map to find the place, we just plug it into our computer, into our phone, and off it goes. The same for health industry, the same for education and robotics. And it's just extraordinary that this vast power is carried in such a tiny device. Technology that is far beyond what put a man on the moon, we carry in our pocket. 
the centralization of this power is extraordinary. And uh, the, the man who wrote something quite profound about power is called First Baron Professor John Acton. He was a professor at the University of Cambridge, and he was a believer and was writing to his friend who was an Anglican, uh, an Anglican bishop. And he wrote in his letter these words, Power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. That's a very deep statement. And in a moment, we'll read a verse that Jesus says about power, about that which holds power. And it's much the same thing. It's that unrestrained power, power, unless it is disciplined, tends to dominate. And I've put it up like this. The key life choice when it comes to technology is that we have to see that technology is not necessarily good or bad in itself but it is extremely powerful. Like anyone or anything powerful, it if, if it is not in essence a humble servant, it will become an oppressive master. Master your technology. Don't let technology master you. That is a key life choice for growth. I'd like us to look at the way Jesus says this and then the way Paul says it. Jesus in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Jesus is saying, when it comes to some other thing that has power, you must understand you cannot serve both. You cannot have two masters. You cannot be mastered by one thing and mastered by another. Masters do not cohabit. You will either love one and hate the other or be devoted to one and despise the other. The human heart is not made for two masters. It can't happen. And what happens with something powerful, be it money, be it technology, be it whatever, it will try to usurp the authority of God in our lives and say that it is of greater authority. You can break these rules of God, but you must satisfy me. And the reality is God's saying, don't serve two masters, be satisfied in me alone and despise this other. This thing must be a, not even a close second. It's just nowhere in comparison to me. I love it when Jesus says, he who does not hate his father and mother is not worthy of me. Just get this clear. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so high are God's thoughts above our thoughts. We really do need to get this clear that God sees himself as in an absolute individual unique position in our lives. And he says, nothing else must compete. Not for your devotion, not for your attention, not for your energy, not for your passion, not for your zeal. The whole of your life is for me. That's where you will be fully satisfied. God says this for our benefit. The way Paul says it in 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 10, he's talking about... Um, Similarly, things that are not necessarily good or bad in themselves, but how do we make right decisions? And he says in 1 Corinthians 10, 23, all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Verse 31, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. So he's saying, whether you're talking about money, whether you're talking about food, whether you're talking about a laptop, whatever is powerful, whatever holds sway in our lives, do everything for the glory of God. These things in and of themselves are not good or bad. The atoms which make up those things are not good or bad. They are created by God, part of what he called good. In themselves, they hold no moral fabric. But what we do with them is of utmost importance. And God must be glorified. What happens is that dangers can creep in. 
And whereas we say, yes, yes, God must be glorified, there are subtle attacks that come from these powerful dynamics. And I'd like us to look at the dangers of digital technology becoming master. And I've put it under three headings, physiological, sociological, and spiritual. And this is not an exhaustive list of the dangers, just like it's not an exhaustive list of the benefits, all that I mentioned there of communication and home entertainment and lifestyle and education and uh, health and robotics, etc. These are not exhaustive lists. They're to give you a feel. The danger of digital technology physiologically is an extraordinary one. The reality is that these screens are so compelling to us, so engaging and captivating, that we can become completely focused and engrossed in them. And it's sometimes easiest to understand what happens to a little child and then realize that that happens all the way through whatever age group. A little child, the, the New York Post did an article, which I'll read an excerpt from in a moment, and said that a mother gave her six-year-old child, five or six-year-old child, a screen because he was doing stuff at school. Minecraft. They had a Minecraft club in first grade. And they were teaching to do creative things, and it was like Lego electronically. But this kid got more and more absorbed, more and more engrossed, until eventually he stopped reading, he stopped baseball, he stopped engaging with the family at all. And, and the parents kept wondering, what's going on with this child? So they tried to take the screen away, and he threw a trauma. And so they let him have the screen back. He said, oh, I'm sure this is educational. His teacher says, it's fine. And the reality is that there is so much going on in the brain as we look at the screen, as we go up levels, as we're told you're liked, as we have fights and as there are differing opinions, it's so engaging that there are things, hormones that are released, dopamine and adrenaline and other things into our brain that are incredibly stimulating. And it is a physical reward for going on to digital technology. Your body subconsciously is physically rewarding you, compelling you, addicting you to continue. And this article finishes... And it says, recent brain imaging re research is showing that the effect on the brain's frontal cortex, that which controls the executive functioning and impulse control, in exactly the same way that cocaine affects, so does digital technology. Technology is so hyper-arousing that it raises dopamine levels, the feel-good neurotransmitter most involved in the addiction dynamic, as much as sex. Chinese researchers call this digital cocaine or digital heroin. And it is no wonder we have such a hard time peeling kids off their screens. Giving our kids free access to social media and, and phones at young ages, they are not ready for it. Their minds cannot cope with the dopamine. They can only have it up to a certain hour and you take it away. They're children, you can take the phone away. We've got to intervene as parents. But as companies, we now have to deal with the influx of kids that are coming into our companies with addiction. Watch, I see it all the time, walk through any office. You'll see the older employees have their phones on the sides of their computers as they're working. You'll see the youngest employees have their phones face up in front of their keyboards between their arms as they're working. And this is how they work. And the, the, the science is alarming. They did uh, experiments on mice, where they, they did the multitasking. They, they, changed the, they, changed, they put flashing lights to mimic going from the computer to the cell phone, the computer to the cell phone, to the TV. The mice that were exposed to the changing lights, it took them three times longer to solve a maze than the mice that weren't, and the damage was permanent. The reality is it's not just kids who get linked and completely connected. It's every level. Grandmothers who are sitting playing Scrabble and not even noticing their grandbaby and filling in the latest word. We are disconnecting out of life. 
This happens in the brain. And when that frontal cortex goes, it's so hard to reprogram it. And this is why we have to prevent our youngest from getting to digital technology. Hold them back from that for as long as physically possible. Let them run, let them play, let them light fires and fall out of trees. Obviously, in, with, within bounds, but let them experience and feel the reality of life. Hold them back from digital technology as much as possible. Uh, who was the founder of Apple? Steve Jobs. His home was digital free of entertainment. He did not allow flat screens, digital screens for entertainment in the home. And the founders of Google and the founders of WikiLeaks and the founders of Microsoft, all of them the same. Their kids go to zero technology schools. Reality. They see it as being the best possible thing physiologically for their children. Sociologically, it is a waste of time. It not, it's not a total waste of time, but over Use is a waste of time. The, the average use between 15 years old and 24 years old in the States, and it's probably much the same for anyone who has access to the internet, is two and a half to three and a half hours a day, recreational digital screens. And if you do the math, three and a half times seven, 24 hours, that is one full day a week. And if you take eight hours, as the most productive in a day, that is three lots of most productive, three productive days of the week taken out. And that can lead to huge self-absorption. In normal conversation, we would talk about ourselves 40% of the time. How are you? And how are you? And there's a to and fro. But on this thing, it's just about you. You're going to post something, it's about you. It's what you're eating, what you're drinking, where you are, what your kid's done, what your friend's done. What you're... It's, it's you at the center. Very rarely does somebody just post something about something completely objective. Even if it is about a political thing or whatever, it's how it's affecting me. And so there's the self-absorption that can happen. And that sadly leads to anxiety and stress. Because just like everyone else is profiling themselves in their best possible light, so you are comparing yourself to their best. And very often we're sitting at home, we might be in our slippers and just chilled out and breadcrumbs lying around, and we're comparing ourselves to the top pictures, filter or no filter, of our friends and others. As Steve Furchick great preacher says, we end up comparing our behind the scenes with everyone else's highlights reel. And we start to feel inadequate. And we start to isolate. And the ability for the newer generations to be socially connected is more challenged than ever before. But lastly, the spiritual dangers. And these are by far the worst. I just summarize them as validation instead of salvation, distraction instead of recreation, and being conformed to the world, not transformed by the word. Validation instead of salvation is going to man instead of God. At the end of this message, I'm just going to show two of my favorite TikTok clips. And one of them is of uh, well, the first one is of a grandpa beating his grandson at, ba at basketball, and I think he does it in such a funky way. But the second one is of Lionel Messi with his sweetheart from five years old who he married a couple of years ago. They'd been together and had kids before, and it's a whole story, but he's married her, and he's arriving at a gala event. And this is the kind of life that we compare ourselves to. And I just think he's fantastic, not as good as, as Cristiano Ronaldo, who being Portuguese, will we'll be leading the soccer team in heaven. But he, he is amazing. Lionel Messi is amazing. And, and you compare to this. And you say, well, maybe let me, I'm going to like. I'm going to join this group. I'm going to post. And then somebody else posts. And you, oh, I'm part of this. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and you get your buzz from being associated in this virtual world with this guy. And the reality is that all this glitz and all this glamour is nothing compared to Christ, it will all pass away and Jesus will remain forever. And we are to get our validation, our sense of worth and significance and belonging from Christ.
If we don't, our identity gets shaken because we come face to face with our inadequacies. The Messi's and the Ronaldo's will be retiring. They come face to face with their limitations and time marches on. Jesus is the same yesterday, today and forever. Don't let your identity be shaken by going to man for your validation. Distraction instead of recreation, I think this is a massive, massive issue. More instead of less. This attacks our energy. If, if we get validation from men and not from God, it attacks our identity. If we go for distraction instead of recreation, it attacks our energy. And we need energy for life. And God's way of doing energy is to say, be led by still waters. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He leads me by still waters. He restores my soul. How do I not want? How do I deal with all these challenges? Be led by still waters. He leads me by quiet waters, by pastures. He prepares a place for me in the place of my enemies. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Why would you ever want to sit and think about Barcelona and how amazing Messi is and just be so sad that you are not a better soccer player and if only you could have a girlfriend like that or if only you could have a boyfriend like that or if only you could whatever. When we can be led by Christ, know him, be in his house forever. I'm so excited about the celebrities who are coming to know Jesus. I'm trusting that the church in the latter days is going to be radiant and glorious and that people with different talents and capacities in every different area will give glory to God. But we need to be able to rest. We need to be able to pace. Jesus did it. He healed people all night. And then early morning, they brought more and he said no. And he went to a quiet place and he prayed. And we need to be able to be free from distraction. Phone off, internet off, alone with Jesus. And lastly here, conform to the world, not transformed by the word. The problem with constantly looking at this, the spiritual danger is that you just start copying everything that it says. And what the world says about sex and every other subject is usually in direct contradiction with God. God's ways are higher than our ways. And so to... Steer away from that, the compromised integrity. It is to be transformed by the renewing of your mind, to be in God's word and in God's presence. And so these are the dangers. And I'd like to finish with how to hit those dangers. Uh, in light of the benefits and in light of the pitfalls, what should we do as believers facing this? Well, number one, courageously recognize the danger of technology digital technology in particular. And it takes courage. It takes courage to look at it and say, no, this is real. What Scott is talking about and the reality of dopamine and adrenaline and what it can do to me physically and what it can do to me socially and what it can do to me spiritually is real. And look at it for what it is. Don't shrink away. The devil loves you to think that he doesn't even exist. He loves being in the shadows. As it's not that bad. They're totally overacting. And that's exactly what happens with drink and with gambling and with every other thing that can destroy your life. Oh, a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit is fine, it's fine, it's fine. And if you can handle, it's fine. Just like Paul said, everything is lawful, but not everything is beneficial. To look at this and understand, this is powerful. That which is powerful is either going to be a humble servant or a domineering master. And you need to look at that reality and see it for what it is. Particularly this generation. No generation has ever before been like you. You were born into the digital age. You were born with smartphones, smart houses, smart cars. You're going to be in touch with it all the time. Understand that this is a monster. This is powerful. Number two, courageously evaluate your own position. Courageously evaluate, how am I dealing with it? The first one is an objectivity exercise, that it is powerful. The second issue is a subjectivity exercise, what power 
does it have over me? And I would encourage you to write out some notes like, how do you think you're handling digital technology? And then ask those who love you, who live closest to you, what do they think about how you're handling it? And that may be painful because it's an evaluation of your own ability. And if you feel pain, it's an it's a, it's a acid test. It's a like almost 99.9% .9 sure they are right, you are wrong. It's called pride. It pricks us. The thing that has power and control over you does not want to be dislodged, and it will feed you negative emotions. Oh, I'm not on my phone too much. I, you will want to react negatively. Listen to them. They love you. They probably brought you into the world. They've probably paid your school fees and university. They, they care for you, these people that you're going to talk to. They probably have walked with you through other problems. They might be a housemate sharing rent. These are people that care for you. I found this the hardest. And I'll tell you about my situation in a moment. Thirdly, courageously change your behavior. Take this evaluation and go to God and pray and receive his strength, his perspective. And in that process, I would really encourage you to find a friend who knows and loves Jesus and who you can trust and confide in that friend. We've got host team leaders up here. We'd love to walk through this with anyone. And you'll find the more vulnerable you are, the more real you are about making something so powerful your servant that you despise it in comparison to God, you will never regret. For me, when I did an evaluation of this in my home, my wife said that I come home at 6 or 6.30 in the evening, but I'm not home because I keep this on. The messages go, I'm replying to things even while I'm at the table. I'm offending the kids. They don't process it like that at first. My dad's offending me. They just feel I'm obviously not as important as those people that daddy's talking to. It's communicating values that you're not intending to, but it's not working. It was so hard for me to do away with this. But eventually I did, and I prayed about it, and I said, you are right. And the deal now is I get home and I turn this thing off as I get home and it goes into the bread bin, kudunk. And it was a fun thing that we did that the whole family could know. Dad is also changing. Dad is making technology his slave. Dad is despising this and he is elevating his time with us. He values us. He esteems us. He cares for us. It did so much for our family. And I found my head clearing. I found my connection with Claire so much better. Putting technology into its right place was painful, and even now is something that I have to constantly be hitting, and I think at the moment I'm in a good patch. I'd like to finish by playing two of my favorite TikTok clips. I think they're 30 seconds each, the granddad and Messi, and then I'd love to pray for us. Father, thank you so much that in a world with so much glitz and glamour and so much guts and pain, the thrills and spills of life, that we can come to you for our salvation, that we do not need to go to man or man's things for validation, but we can come to the Messiah, the one who holds all things together and know that we are liked. Know that we are loved. Know that we dwell in your house forever, those who have received you as their Lord and Savior. Thank you, Father, so much that we do not have to be endlessly distracted, but we can be recreated. We can go into times of rest, times of stillness, times of quiet, where we are alone with you, 
where we're reading your word and where we're in your presence. Lord, thank you that our identity and our energy can come from you and not from the digital technology. And Father, I pray that as a church we would not be conformed to the pattern of this world. We'd not just copy like lemmings the ways of the world, but that we would be transformed by the renewing of our minds. That we would live above technology. That technology would be our servant. And that God, you would be our master. That we would despise this technology. That we would make it a slave to us and not put ourselves in subjection to it. Father, I pray for the physical, sociological, and spiritual vibrancy of River of Life Church. That we would be equipped and make key life choices for growth in the area of technology that bring blessing to our lives and those around us today, this year, next year, and down the ages. For your glory, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.